But first, let's talk about one of the more contentious movies released this year, not just because of how it was released, but the film itself. And that's Wonder Woman 1984. (laughs) And I'm quite interested, Andrew, in your reaction to Wonder Woman 1984 as someone who hates with a fiery passion all superheroes and everything to do with them. Not true. I don't hate all superhero movies because I loved this. That's a lie. You're lying. <laughs> do not lie to me, sir. This was the biggest mess of a movie I think I've seen in a long while. It's it's a very muddled movie. I will give you that. Muddled and is an understatement. A lot of Warner Brothers was was riding on Wonder Woman 1984 to basically save Warner Brothers movie business for Why? this year. Why would you bank on that? Because the first movie was very popular and it was the best of the DC EU movies uh, by a wide margin, I think. Yeah, I would say the Joker is the best, but I, I don't know if they're making that officially part of the universe. I mean, it's got DC comic book characters in it, but not the DC EU of the Justice League movies. That was more of a standalone picture because mm-hmm. they already have their Joker with the Suicide Squad, Jared Leto Joker. And uh, then I was hoping they'd replace him with Phoenix. But then again, I don't think Phoenix would actually sign up for multiple superhero films. Well, James Gunn is going to do The Suicide Squad, which is supposed to come out later on this year, which is a <laughs> sequel to Suicide Squad that everyone hated with Will Smith. Are oh, you confused okay. yet? Because one's yeah. called Suicide Squad and one's called The Suicide Squad. It's not like anybody's going to get that mixed up. And the follow-up will, of course, be A Suicide Squad. Yeah, I mean, really, if you just put anything in front of Suicide Squad, yeah. apparently Warner Brothers is all in. <laughs> Jesus. But the first Wonder Woman movie, which came out a couple of years ago, I think is widely regarded as the most popular and the best of the DCEU movies. Did you like it? I did like it. I thought it was a fun tone. It was a traditional superhero movie. It's not like it did anything unique or groundbreaking when Steve Rogers, oh wait, I'm sorry, not Steve Rogers, uh, Steve Trevor sacrificed himself at the end. It's not like they ripped that off from Captain America or anything. Well, I was going to say the first one felt exactly like Captain America. It basically was up to even the ending when literally a guy named Steve sacrifices himself in a plane. It's the exact same, but it was still fun. And I still like Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. The casting of her as that character, she carries that movie. She carries this movie and the relationship between those two characters are the best thing about both of them, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. I love Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, and it feels like she was meant to play that part. In the way that Robert Downey Jr. was meant to play Iron Man, she just fits it so well. But I I don't know if I like her yet as an actress. And that could just be the writing, and no fault of her own. But in terms of the physical language, specifically in fight scenes, I believe that she is capable of everything she's doing. And the way she moves is just so graceful and swift. Mm -hmm. It's so satisfying seeing the way that she moves through a fight scene. But performance-wise, as far as acting, I- I'm still not completely sold. They're also not asking her to be De Niro and Raging Bull either. Or, fine, to put a equal agenda on it. They're not asking her to be Meryl Streep in Devil Wars Prada. See, that's more comedic. But, you know, they're not asking her to do that. I'm not expecting her to do that, but she can give a better performance, at least in the dialogue scenes. You don't need to give an Oscar-winning performance. You don't, and that's why I think that she's really great, is that she's incredible physically. She's got charisma and charm in a way that most movie stars do not. She is a movie star on the screen. She doesn't need to be the greatest actress in the world. She's great at being Wonder Woman. I agree. She is great as Wonder Woman, but the dialogue scenes, with the exception of a few, are a bit lackluster. So let's get into it, shall we? In case you don't know, Wonder Woman 1984 takes place in 1984. Ah. I know, right? They're turning the clock forward, what, 70 years? Because the first one was World War I. Yeah. Wonder Woman is now an archaeologist working for the Smithsonian or some sort of... No, you're right. It's a Smithsonian. No, I was going to say some sort of archaeologist or archaeologist adjacent type of profession. Her and Kristen Wiig say a bunch of things that they do with a lot of like archaeologist, endocrinologist, that's actually a doctor. I don't really know, but there's a list of things that she does clearly. And whatever it is she does, she deals with artifacts and Indiana Jones stuff. The two main villains in this, because the plot is difficult to sort of sum up. Essentially, she finds an artifact, comes into contact with an artifact called the Dreamstone that allows the person holding it to 
make a wish and that wish comes true. But it's a monkey's paw scenario. That wish has consequences, as these things do. The two villains in the movie, Pedro Pascal and Kristen Wiig, are definitely not presented as villains at the very beginning. I mean, you know they are because most people have seen the trailer. And Pedro Pascal plays this, you know, sort of Gordon Gecko mixed with a televangelist yeah. type of con man. And it all kind of coalesces in these people making wishes that grant them power that then goes too far. And then Wonder Woman has to stop them. That is the main plot, I would say, of the movie. Would you disagree? No, that's as well as you can explain that plot. Because it's a thing that I was trying to succinctly figure out, <laughs> sum it all up, and go, okay, two people make wishes and get ex immense amounts of power and then go too far. Now, Wonder Woman, or I should use her non-Wonder Woman name, Diana Prince, also makes a wish and says, I wish that Steve Trevor, the man that I loved from World War One." would come back. And so she also makes a wish and the ramifications of that wish impact her physically as well throughout the movie. And that is where the conflict all comes in both externally and internally for her. All of that preamble aside, what did you think? Aside from it was laughable. There was no logic whatsoever. It didn't follow any of the rules it set for itself. It was a complete and utter mess. And it was awkward in a lot of moments. That being said, I think before I can get into all of that, I'm going to put a spoiler alert here. Time codes in the description as always. First off, there was no logic when it came to the monkey's paw. Because it takes something from you, Andrew. And sure, they say it takes from you that which is special about you. But why then can Pedro Pascal later dictate what he wants in return for a wish granted? Mm -hmm. And then Pedro Pascal wishes that he could be the stone himself so that people have to wish through him which also doesn't make sense. Unclear. Why is he dying? Why is he bleeding from the ears? And then, okay, Pedro Pascal goes to Egypt. Boy, does he. Geopolitical scene in this movie. They play real fast and loose with a whole bunch of things. Yeah, they just run amok all over the world. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> There's a point where one of the, first of all, they, they don't get the politics of Egypt correct at all. They use a, a completely different political system for who gets what in Egypt, like actually in Egypt, you'd probably know better than I would. But A, that's not how politics work there. B, you can't just say, I want my land back. And then he's like, granted, you got it. Not how it works either. There's a whole bunch of things in this. Thing. When he says, I want my land back, I don't understand why a wall is erected yeah. and then keeping out the poor people. And I'm just like, wait, what? So, did all, the, so did all the people within the wall get magically like transported outside the wall? <laughs> I have no clue. And then like, why does Chris Pine go into another man's body when everything else just appears? Oh, that one actually didn't bother me. <laughs> why not? It should bother you. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's funny. In the beginning, that didn't even bother me. I was like, okay. That's cool. So wishes have to come true through a series of logical means. Yeah. Maybe he was just reincarnated into this man. That's that's exactly what I thought. I was like, his mind and his soul go into this guy, but on the exterior, he still looks like some guy. But then they do the the panning around shot where you go behind Diana's head, and then on the right side, it's that guy, and then on the left side, it's Chris Pine's face. And I'm like, and it was early enough in the movie to that point where I was like, yeah, it's fine, whatever. <laughs> it was enough. early enough in the movie to establish a set of rules that they threw away later on in the Especially movie. Because like, really, the I, president... I'm going to tell you, my journey with this movie was, was a real roller coaster because <laughs> I actually didn't mind it and I, I enjoyed it for a solid hour. Unfortunately, this movie is two and a half hours long. But the very beginning, like the first 10 minutes, infuriated me. Infuriated me. because. Really? It, Oh, it did. I, I was so angry at it. The first Why? 10 minutes, more than anything else. Even the bafflingly not great conclusion. No, because the conclusion is superhero CGI nonsense. And I'm used to that. But the beginning establishes Diana as a little girl. And she's in these sort of Olympic games, right? And she's, she's really small. She's what? eight years old, however old Something she is, like that, yeah. 10 years old. And she's going up against these, what are essentially Olympians. They don't establish the rules of the game, for one. This is another games scenario where they have spectators in an arena. Yes. And then everybody okay. runs outside and can't see. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, but that bothered me it, so they, much. They do it in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire too. And I'm yeah. like, why do you have spectators in the stands when they can't see underneath the water in Harry Potter? Why do you have a spectator sport that can't be spectated? Exactly. And then... The rules are established though, or, or maybe they're not established, they're implied. What bothered me was the arrows. So they're riding on horseback and they're shooting the arrows through the hoop. And yeah. then the, the banner comes down after each yeah. person has shot the arrow through the hoop. Now, Diana misses a checkpoint. And yeah. doesn't shoot an arrow through a hoop, but is not penalized at that point, which they did not establish that she they the have to hit the that they have to hit the checkpoint. So it seems to me at that point that the checkpoints, the arrows don't matter. Well, that's the thing is it could be one of two things is that they're doing it for the sake of the spectators so that they know their progress. Which is what I thought. Or in the way that most games are, you have to hit every single checkpoint. So you almost checkpoint. have to have kind of like a previous understanding of like the language of games in a way but also Which i agree in that, yeah yeah because in the moment where she slides under it i had the question of like oh was she allowed to do that or not my thought too and i don't know that she even knew <laughs> she was, i don't think she knew the rules <laughs> when when she did slide under that i was like oh okay well maybe she's found a loophole like nobody said you couldn't go down the down the mountain you know, and you she know, lost her horse. What was she going to do? And she lost her horse. So I'm like, okay. So she's thinking, even though she's she smart, would, yeah. she's smart. But then at the very end, when she's about to win, which by the way, if she was competing in these games as an eight year old, it'd be like putting an eighth grader in an NBA game. It wouldn't work. She would have lost immediately. But let's just but go with a prodigy, I think. Let's just go with she's a prodigy. Fine. And then Robin Wright shows up. And just as she's about to throw the lance through the final hoop, Robin Wright rips the lance out of her hand and throws it to the ground and goes, no you're you're, essentially (laughs) yeah like you're not allowed to win because you cheated like you haven't earned it like you did it wrong and i'm thinking but you didn't establish that but and that's fine if you didn't establish it because races have checkpoints like you can't in a nascar race just cut across the field fine but then the lesson she teaches her is well you don't have it inside of you like you haven't earned the right to win because you cheated i'm like no you just didn't tell her the rules like she's just disqualified it's not that she didn't well, earn we don't, we don't know whether or not she knew the rules i imagine if she knew the rules that she would slide down pick up a rock and then throw it at her arrow i don't i don't know like that's the thing is like it i agree it really irritated me <laughs> but believe it or not i actually like the opening more than i did the first movie because i didn't like the first movie at all I know. but i enjoyed the giant gold obstacle monument thing and the way that she navigates through it as the tiniest person amongst them all but when i started to feel like meh about it was when they jumped into the ocean like you said yeah but also the fact that they start riding horses it's kind of an anticlimactic final obstacle like it becomes a race and not about physicality at that point when you really think about it because all of them have perfect aim apparently like none of them miss their arrows so the stakes of that specific objective weren't established necessarily and maybe that's what it is it's like they could have fixed that entire scene if they had one of the horse riders miss her arrow have to go back pick it up and then like try to shoot it and then that establishes in your mind it is oh you have to hit you have to hit the arrow you have to hit exactly Yeah, so they could have easily fixed that with a 10-minute sequence, beginning sequence, which you don't need that much of a beginning sequence. Movie's two and a half hours. Why not? Let's just put in another minute. Put in another minute and establish something that clears up all the confusion. And look, when it comes down to it, it does communicate the central theme. Basically, that which is worth having must be worked for and not given or taken. Like cheating, cheaters never prosper, essentially, is what Robin Wright's saying to her. Yeah, but to me again, that's nonsensical for what they showed because I'm like, oh, she just didn't know the rules. Like, just next year she comes. Yeah, next year she comes back. She goes around the track. There you go. It's not that she didn't deserve to win this time. She just was disqualified. There you go. By not clearly establishing the rules of the game, it dilutes the effect of Diana learning the lesson that cheaters don't prosper because we are meant to identify with her in that scene. Mm -hmm. So when she does skip the checkpoint and is knowingly cheating. We should feel that tinge of guilt, but in the actual scene, we are both blindsided and confused because you don't come out of that scene having learned any lesson. If anything, you feel somewhat slighted because the rules weren't necessarily explained to you. But honestly, that didn't bother me as much as the rules of the stone stone. that made no sense. Yeah. Like, and the body thing really bothered me because it is really a, a, kind of a pivotal thing for her character. Like, why does his consciousness have to go into this dude's body when everything else, like the president of the United States asked for more nukes and they just appear? 
True. They literally turn to uh-huh. the president and say, all these nukes are coming online. We don't know where they came from. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense. Why and can't then, Trevor just be popped out of 1917 to here? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And just show up. Like, And I would have been completely fine with that. Yeah. But then also, like, does this guy not have a job, a family? That's what I thought. And then they made love in his body. Like, is that sexual assault? And then on top of that, what if he had an STD? It was the 80s. There was like an AIDS epidemic. Like, what is happening? But Andrew, we get to see Chris Pine again. But that's so ineffective. Is like, okay, like, but you're Andrew, just going to throw it away by just the pan of the camera of like, hey, it's it's Chris Pine. I honestly would have been completely Chris Pine is fine. really handsome, Andrew. We want to see Chris Pine again. Andrew, stop questioning the movie magic. It should have been Wonder like Woman. a... It should have been like a shallow hal situation where Chris Pine is this fat dad body guy and everyone is basically like you're with him. Like that would have been really funny. Don't put him in another handsome white man's body. Put him in a black dude's body. I want to see that. That's true. That dude was very (laughs) handsome. They did replace Chris Pine with just another handsome dude or another handsome dude with Chris Pine. When he walks into the party, I was like, wait, is that Chris Pine? They look so similar. They do. Yeah. Like in the trailer, I think they actually did have Chris Pine redo that scene. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Because I remember seeing Chris Pine in the trailer. I, I could be wrong. See, I like, again, this is me making excuses for stuff I like. I like seeing Gal Gadot and Chris Pine on screen together. And I thought the best moment of the movie, because you immediately know that, oh, to end this movie, she's going to have to let go of Chris Pine again. She's going to have yeah. to say goodbye to Steve Trevor. Yeah. He's not going to survive this movie. The ending scene where she, where they say goodbye to each other, even though I completely, it was so effective. No, I completely agree. Like when she walks away and he says, I'm always going to love you. Like, cause it is really heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. But, and the way that she turns around, it's almost like she rips herself. From, she played that very well. And the scene in the apartment where he's talking to her, he says, we got to talk about this. Like if you found the one and you have to live forever, that is heartbreaking, you know, and that I agree was effective. I like Chris Pine. I liked half of the comedic moments with him. And then the other half, I was like, nah, I love when (laughs) when she's like, oh, by the way, there's radar. We'll get to the whole flying situation in a second. But by the way, you know, there's radar. And he's like, well, shit, Diana. Like, I really like I was like, oh, that's really funny. You know (laughs) why? Is why, Chris he, why does he know how to fly a plane when he was a man from 1917? How would he know how to fly a jet? Andrew, you didn't know that plane technology hasn't changed in 70 years? Oh, my God. All airplanes are the same. All you have to do is hit two buttons and then pull back on the joystick and then you can fly. Not to mention the fact that the propulsion methods are completely different. Like if he got into another propeller plane, then OK, maybe. And why is a Smithsonian leaving jets on the runway <laughs> yeah. fueled and ready to go? It was very convenient that they were able to find that plane. Be like, wow, we really happened upon this plane. <sighs> Good thing it was here. Mm-hmm. Unlike really? Tenant, where they have to crash a plane into an airport. I haven't seen it. Don't spoil it. <laughs> yeah, that was in the trailer. It's fine. What did you think of Pedro Pascal and Kristen Wiig? I love both of them. I really, I, and Pedro Pascal, when I was like, oh, he's going to be the saving grace of this film. I think he was. <sighs> I don't. I liked him a lot. He's clearly having a lot of fun. I love that he's doing Gordon Gecko on speed. And just like as a, as a con man, like a shyster televangelist con man, I, lo- I loved watching him. I liked his motivation too, which was not yeah. the typical comic book motivation of I want to blow up the world. He wanted to be a, a success in the eyes of his son. I was like, oh, that's very sweet. And again, took it too far. I, I legitimately felt bad for him and I almost wanted him to succeed in some way. But what is his motivation? Because it, be I don't think- su- To be rich and successful and powerful. That's about as much as they give and it. And that is such a weak motive. And his whole power is rendered useless after everyone has made their wishes already because they only get one wish each. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it that he's always been the underdog and he wanted to grant all the underdog their wishes. But then he turns around and then takes their health and their life force and safety. I mean, mm-hmm. because in the beginning it was it was established pretty strongly and I liked it. I felt bad for him. You feel his desperation. Yes. And you're almost like, oh, yeah, he's going to shove it in that investor's face. Those moments are great, but it just kind of fell short and went way too far to the point where I was like, this is almost cartoonish. Oh, you mean you mean the part at the end when Kristen Wiig turns into an actual cheetah? Uh, I love Kristen Wiig so much, but I didn't buy it. That was so weird. So weird, right? It was so bizarre and uncomfortable, and it looked like the movie Cats. And I really dug Kristen Wiig's performance, too. And I dug her motivation, too, of she's this underappreciated worker that gets kicked around. By the way, cartoonish introduction of her being kicked around, too. You know, she, she drops the papers, you know. 
like well, like and- they do in 40s comedies like because ladies can't carry papers and then one of those dudes kicked her <laughs> and then left i was well, like, no, like he, walks, he walks past and then she turns to the guy at the counter and she's about to like comment on it and he turns around too and i'm like oh that's funny like she does that type of comedy very well but i agree in the beginning i was like oh that's kind cheap. of an antiquated trope but then again it was in the 80s right. so maybe they're trying to fit the 80s movie cliches which i mean i'm fine with if they want to fit sort of the aesthetic of uh, the film well yeah i mean they did do a classic 80s fashion montage exactly yeah you know, I, was it a little insulting to women carrying papers yes and to our intelligence because and like ah eh. Really, well, and like doing that one. wish revolved around being able to walk in heels basically <laughs> yeah i mean kind of but i will say the scene where she beats up the guy that sexually assaults her yeah i feel like that scene was this cathartic symbolic moment very satisfying i mean just the way that it was shot and edited like the slow progression felt very intentional and that could just be the lens that i'm seeing it through because wonder woman really was kind of a beacon of empowerment with the all-female leading cast and the female director but something about that scene felt very different like we weren't watching the same movie anymore but it was also a very powerful scene i I really liked it it was a very effective scene because they did do a good job in a kind of insulting way of setting her up as very meek and setting her up to want to be powerful. Yeah. And that was a really great revengey way of showing that. And it was, that was in a very effective scene. That is the part of the movie that I did like. This is still in the hour of the movie. I liked the yeah, middle, the first the hour, middle, I, I the middle parts of this. Mm-hmm. I thought were extremely effective. No, I, I agree with that. Once it starts turning into outlandish cartoon nonsense, is when it lost me. As soon as he turns into the stone is when I was like, okay, you you stopped explaining things and everything you did explain in the first half, you threw out the window and decided to go a complete different direction. Because that is about an hour into it. That's about the midpoint. Yeah. They, yeah. This takes a long time to get to the actual villains of the story. I'm kind of okay with that. They're also not villains right off the bat. They have to kind of form into it. Mm-hmm. So I'm okay with that. But I also can't pinpoint the moment in which Kristen Wiig decides to be evil other than the fact that she comes to the realization that she might have to give back what she wished for. But at the same time, none of these people have the realization that the stone actually did the thing that they wanted it to do. Like Kristen Wiig never had the realization that the reason why she's getting all this attention now is because of the stone, other than maybe when she realizes she has superwoman strength. No, because there was that scene where they go and talk to the guy who can like read the scrolls or whatever. Yeah. And it's never like out. It's never said, hey, I have superpowers because of the stone. I think she does realize it, but it's never said. I think at the moment she figures it out. Yeah, but then Steve Trevor tells Diana, well, what about your powers? Or that's why you're losing your powers. And Kristen Wiig doesn't flinch at that comment. No. She didn't know she had powers. And, And so I was like, wait, you're assuming that these people know these things. We don't get to see them realize it. Like, why isn't there a moment of recognition? And that's the thing that bothered me is that they were so concerned with the scale of everything that they didn't bother following any of the rules they set Mm -hmm. or even explaining the rules that they set. Especially by the end. Yeah. Again, it had me in the first half and it lost me just gradually. I mean, very, very probably precipitously, to be honest, not gradually. And like even in the White House, when Chris Pine handcuffs himself to Pedro Pascal, that would have been a perfect moment to wish. But does he get a wish? Is he a real person? But he is a real person because he's in another man's body. True, so but it's that would have been okay. But he's a weird manifestation of a dead guy from seventy years ago. Is he a real person? I have I no clue. No. <laughs> oh god would you get hbo max for this not for this no god no i'd get hbo max for lovecraft country alone see and i think that's hbo's strategy like if we can't get him with wonder woman we'll get him with lovecraft all, we'll of, get him warner with brothers. all of warner brothers or we'll get him with the flight attendant or we'll get him with this that and the other thing there's just so much on there it kind of doesn't even seem like this mattered this shouldn't have been the pilot film for warner brothers to release on hbo max i think coronavirus forced their hand on that though yeah no they, i don't think they really had a choice necessarily but they could have done tenant really i mean that would have been honestly if they released tenant on hbo max but i bet christopher nolan would have lost his beans. He would have burned if, Warner Brothers to the ground. And they would let him because he made that studio. They'd have been like, yeah, right. Uh, we, under, we understand. 
Yeah. You want to yeah. you want to become a Batman? Batman? That's what I want. How do you how do you feel about Batman? Maybe uh, Batman does time travel, <laughs> yeah, right? But I think we can move on to oh another winner, another <laughs> success story. Of- you know, I-